Welcome to This Plus Podcast, the Employment Law Counselor, hosted by Jeff Stewart. Before we get started, we'd like to remind everyone that the information and opinions expressed by our speakers today are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of their employers or plus. The contents of these materials may not be relied upon as legal advice. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Employment Law Counselor Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Stewart, and today we'll be covering pregnancy discrimination and some new laws in 2023 that put additional responsibilities on employers dealing with pregnant employees. This podcast is a collaboration between White and Williams, LLP, and the Professional Liability Underwriting Society, commonly referred to as PLUS. While our podcast is not legal advice, It is a practical discussion between two attorneys that deal with the maze and minefield of labor and employment law on a daily basis. If you like what you hear, please give us a five-star review and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Today, I'm joined by one of my colleagues here at White & Williams, Tanya Selgato, who practices out of our firm's Philadelphia office. How are you doing today, Tanya? Great. How are you doing, Jeff? I am wonderful. I'm excited for this discussion on pregnancy discrimination. How about you? I am as well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So why don't we just dive right in? You know, when people have asked me about pregnancy discrimination, I always tell them that there's really a patchwork of laws that have kind of dealt with this over the years. But there's no, while we have a Pregnancy Discrimination Act, that is not a end-all and be-all. Would you agree? Yes, for sure. And I would agree that this is definitely a patchwork Under the current state of the law, you have a variety of federal laws, as well as a variety of uh, laws passed under state and local jurisdictions. And there's certainly some significant gaps under the current pregnancy discrimination law. It was an amendment to Title VII, and it provides for protection from discrimination, but it doesn't explicitly provide for accommodations such as maternity leave. And until the Supreme Court's decision in Young versus UPS back in 2015, it was very unclear to what extent pregnant employees were entitled to accommodations. And and quite honestly, even after that decision, the, the law was less than clear as to an employer's obligation to provide accommodations. And that's why we have some of these new laws that have been passed here in 2023. Now, I also, I find it interesting that, you know, a lot of people don't know that the EEOC actually puts out, you know, their kind of enforcement priorities, kind of a list of things that they're going to be on the lookout for on a regular basis. And currently pregnancy discrimination is one of those priorities. Yes. And certainly employers do not want to be on the EEOC's hot list. When the EEOC files an action on behalf of an employee, they typically will issue a press release. And you really don't want to be the the test case for the EEOC on their new enforcement priority. Absolutely not. So let's talk a little bit. You know, I mentioned in our in our opening that there's really a patchwork of laws that deal with pregnancy discrimination. Tanya, you mentioned the Pregnancy Discrimination Act as one of the patchwork of laws. One of the others is the Family and Medical Leave Act, commonly known as the FMLA. And what that does is provide up to 12 weeks of leave for eligible employees. The problem is that there are many employees who are not eligible under the FMLA, either because their company is not large enough and therefore the law doesn't apply to them, or if they are too new. You know, the FMLA requires that you be with your employer for at least a year before you're eligible for any leave. That's right. And you have to have worked 1,250 hours in the previous 12 months as well. So that might also eliminate coverage for some part-timers. Absolutely. So there's... The Pregnancy Discrimination Act, there's the Family and Medical Leave Act, and as you mentioned, there's questions as to whether or not accommodations would fall under the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or not. So that's part of the patchwork. Now, we also have the Affordable Care Act. Do you want to talk about some of the provisions in the Affordable Care Act when it comes to pregnancy and postpartum? 
So the Affordable Care Act amended the Fair Labor Standards Act, and this goes back to March of 2010. And under this amendment, employers are required to provide nursing mothers with reasonable break time to express breast milk. However, this law has some important limitations. It only applies to non-exempt employees under the FL. FLSA, and it only applies for up to one year after the child's birth. The amendment does require employers to provide an appropriate private space for these pumping breaks other than a bathroom. But again, I think the the, the biggest limitation on the law as it currently stands is the fact that it only applies to non-exempt employees, thus leaving, you know, an entire portion of the workforce without protection under the federal law. Now, that said, there are some state laws that have already provided protection for nursing mothers, as well as providing for pregnancy accommodations. But this really varies by jurisdiction. I practice in Pennsylvania, as well as New Jersey. The city of Philadelphia has had an ordinance on the books ever since 2014 that already provides for pump breaks, and it also provides for pregnancy accommodations. Similarly, the New Jersey law also provides for pumping breaks as well as reasonable accommodations from others. And I think it's one of the reasons that we have local and state laws in effect is because there have been these gaps. There have been these, frankly, pregnant employees who are left behind and not receiving protections under, for example, the FMLA or under the Affordable Care Act. And recently... Congress has enacted a pair of laws to try to fill in these gaps. The first one, which became law earlier this year, is the Providing Urgent Maternal Protections for Nursing Mothers Act, also known as the PUMP Act. And what that does is tries to expand that protection for pumping breaks from, as you said, just non-exempt employees under the Affordable Care Act and expands it to all employees. That's right. And it still includes that one-year limitation on the time, but it's it's an important expansion. And, And one thing I think it's important to note is that if you're an employer and you're in a jurisdiction that already has a law on the books concerning pump breaks, make sure that you take a look at that law and compare it to the Pump Act. The state and local jurisdictions often provide more protections than are required under the federal law. For example, some jurisdictions provide for a much a longer period of time. I think I think I heard that California has a period of time for several years after the, the birth of the child. So the, the Pump Act provides a floor, not a ceiling. So those employers that are in those jurisdictions that already have a law, you need to make sure that you comply with both sets of laws to the fullest extent. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other part of this Pump Act that they have attempted to clarify is that employees need to be provided a clean sanitary location for pump breaks that is not a bathroom and that is private. Now, obviously not a bathroom, that's pretty straightforward, but saying, hey, it needs to be private and sanitary means, you know, you don't put people in a janitor's closet. And that privacy piece is something that you may have to think about. For example, if you have offices that all have windows, you may need to provide curtains or some way of making an office completely private. That's right. And, you know, another piece of this consideration for privacy is the fact that a lot of employers have cameras set up throughout the workplace. So you need to give some thought if you're setting up a sort of an ad hoc place for your employee to to pump. Make sure that the cameras are not intruding. You could find yourself in the crosshairs of all kinds of lawsuits, not just a lawsuit under under the Pump Act. Similarly, if you've got employees who are working remotely, 
The PUMP Act does apply to teleworking employees. Um, obviously, they need to be given privacy if, if you're an employer that monitors your employees while they're at home working. You need to provide options for privacy during the pump breaks. Absolutely. So let's shift gears to the other law that is going into effect, actually goes into effect on June 27th, 2023, and that's the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act, which primarily requires accommodations for pregnant workers, and there's no longer any need to show a disability. We're not claiming it's a disability. We're just saying, you know what? Pregnant workers deserve accommodation during pregnancy, the same as a disabled employee would due to their disability. But we're not calling pregnancy a disability. I think that's a really good point. Under the current law, as you point out, pregnancy is not in and of itself a disability. Under the Americans with Disabilities Act, individuals are entitled to accommodations, reasonable accommodations to the extent that they are a qualified individual with a disability. So for example, certain pregnancy-related conditions such as gestational diabetes or perhaps preeclampsia, these types of conditions would rise to the level of being a disability, which would entitle the employee to a, a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. But as you point out, most normal pregnancies do not rise to that level. And yet at the same time, pregnant employees may very well be in need of practical um, accommodations that will enable them to do the job on the same basis as any other employee. And so this law, the, the PWFA, is meant to fill in the gaps and provide for accommodations, even in the absence of an ADA qualifying disability. And that accommodation process is similar to the ADA in that there needs to be an interactive process with the employee. What is it you need? What Let's talk about what the issues are, et cetera. And it doesn't have to be the exact accommodation that someone is looking for, but we need to have that back and forth with the employee. And also, there is an exception if there is an undue hardship to the employer. Now, I always tell employers, don't rely on undue hardship. Let's work with the employees and let's see what accommodations we can come up with to address their issues. Sure. You know, the interactive process is an important component of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And what's interesting about the PWFA is that that's actually sort of baked into the, the the language of the statute. The law definitely anticipates that there's going to be an interactive process, and it provides that it's a violation of the law if an employer forces an employee to accept as a reasonable accommodation an accommodation that was not arrived at through that interactive process. So from my perspective, I think that really highlights the importance of the interactive process when we're talking about pregnancy accommodations. It's always important, but just be aware that it's received particular attention in this particular statutory scheme. Absolutely. And accommodations can take any one of a number of different forms. You know, you may think, oh, somebody needs an accommodation of a more ergonomic chair or something like that. But it could be something like, you know what, closer parking, depending on, you know, the size of the parking lot you've got. It could be something as unusual as appropriate sized uniforms. If you're an employer that requires your employees to wear uniforms, either having pregnancy sized uniforms or an exemption from the uniform requirement during pregnancy, that can be a reasonable accommodation. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. The EEOC has been directed to issue regulations to specifically address reasonable accommodations under the new statute. But in the meantime, to provide guidance, the EEOC has on its website an FAQ, and it does provide a listing of suggested accommodations. So, you know, filling in that gap until we get the regulations from the EEOC, employers would be certainly advised to take a look at that FAQ and take that into account as you are addressing requests for reasonable accommodation. Absolutely. 
Tanya, one of the big changes here or one of the gaps that's filled under the PWFA is requiring employers to provide leave, reasonable leave, for time off for delivery. Not the 12 weeks of the FMLA, but some form of reasonable leave. Yes, yes, that's important. Again, as we were talking about, the Family Medical Leave Act only applies to certain covered employers and it only applies to certain eligible employees. The PWFA applies to employers who have 15 or more employees. So that really fills in the gap and provides a flexible uh, accommodation process for employers and employees who would not otherwise be covered for time off for pregnancy. And, you know, at this point, we don't have the EEOC's regulations. Presumably, they will cover that. In the meantime, I think it's a good idea to to take a look at what types of leave an employer provides for other employees who are similarly situated who need time off, perhaps due to a medical condition, a temporary disability, or a similar type of situation. Six weeks is typically the rule of thumb as as the minimum amount of time off covered for short-term disability policies. And then, of course, you've got the 12-week standard provided by the FMLA. So I think that as a practical matter, employers are going to want to take a look at what is reasonable and makes sense for their workplace, keeping in mind the parameters that are suggested by these other laws. And this is another example of a time where you really want to be proactive and let's establish a standard and then utilize that, not, well, we'll kind of figure it out once someone comes to us. Let's take a look. What are we going to, are we going to provide 12 weeks like the FMLA? Are we going to say, you know what, eight weeks is what makes sense, absent some form of medical complications where then you would be dealing with the ADA. But that's really for an employer to look at until we get that EEOC guidance. Would you agree? Yes, I think that makes sense. And again, that interactive process is going to be important here. Absolutely. Now, the the PWFA also has a non-discrimination provision. And one of the examples of that prohibited discrimination is removing someone from their position based upon the belief that their pregnancy impedes their ability. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an important component of this. And, you know, to some extent that was provided for under the older statute, the PDA. There's sort of this idea that some employers may have, and, and perhaps it comes from, you know, a good place. You want to protect an employee from perceived dangers in the workplace. And so you put someone on leave. You know, be, be, be very much aware that that is not an acceptable employment practice under the current law and certainly not under the PWFA. And, and Tanya, in my experience, a lot of times employers who do this, they remove someone from a position, really and truly believe that they are doing the right thing and acting on the employee's behalf. And yet that's where they can get in trouble. Yes, that's right. That's right. Again, the interactive process is really key here because it may very well be that the employee is perfectly capable of continuing to work. And so to remove them based on an assumption or belief is is specifically addressed in the statute. Absolutely. And the same with requiring the employee to take leave. This isn't just removing somebody from a position and moving them to a different one. But if saying, oh, you know what, you're getting close to your due date, I think you need to be off. That is an example of prohibited discrimination under the law. That's right. That's right. The The law provides that if you remove someone or, or force them to p- be put on a leave of absence when another reasonable accommodation can be provided, that in and of itself is, is an example of prohibited discrimination. Absolutely. So, you know, we've talked about these two new laws here, both the PUMP Act and the PWFA. How are you advising your clients to mitigate their risk? Well, I think a a really good first step would be to take a look at your policies and procedures and your employee handbooks and make sure that your handbooks are updated. It's 
it's really a key to include a provision for reasonable accommodations for pregnancy in the handbook. Good idea to provide examples similar to the examples that are provided in the EEOC's FAQ. Make sure that your managers and supervisors are up to date, you know, provide some training for them on these new provisions. And again, a a key component of all this is to make sure they also understand the anti-retaliation provisions. Making a request for a reasonable accommodation is protected activity and an employee must not be disciplined or otherwise retaliated against for making these requests. So that's a really important first step. Also, be aware of the local laws. Again, make sure that your handbook complies, not just with the federal law, but if your local law provides a higher standard, make sure that your handbook complies fully with the local laws as well as the federal law. And I agree with every one of those points. And what I would add is have a plan before someone comes to you. You know, for example, with regard to the the Pump Act, have a have an area that you're going to designate. This is going to be the pumping room, or this is how we're going to make someone's office meet that definition. But have a plan prior to. I always I'm always a fan of being proactive, not reactive, and this is one where you absolutely can be. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So I always like to give our listeners some key takeaways from our discussion here today. So do you have a key takeaway for our listeners, Tanya? So I would say do not forget the interactive process across the the spectrum of employment laws, whether we're talking about the ADA, whether we're talking about religious discrimination, but particularly in the context of pregnancy accommodations, make sure you have that good faith dialogue with your employees about what accommodations are needed. That's a good one. And, And I think I would actually springboard on what you were saying a minute ago, which is it is time to update your employee handbook. I mean, here's just two examples of new laws in 2023. There were several new laws that took effect last year. And if your handbook hasn't been updated in two years, you are definitely behind. And now is as good a time as any to make sure these are taken care of because employees, while you think, may think, "Eh, they never read the employee handbook. In reality, they do especially when an issue arises. And I guarantee you, if you have an employee that becomes pregnant, they're going to look at what are your policies with regard to leave, with regard to working while pregnant and accommodations, et cetera. And you want them to have the answers at their fingertips. So I would say update your handbook because this is a time when it is specifically looked at. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I want to thank you, Tanya, for joining me. And I want to thank all of our listeners for joining us here on the Employment Law Counselor Podcast, where we try to make sense of the world of labor and employment law. On behalf of myself and Tanya Salgado, we thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review, tell your friends, and subscribe to the podcast. For more information on this and many other topics, please visit the White and Williams website at www.whiteandwilliams.com where you can visit our blog and learn more about the firm. Until next time, stay safe and stay compliant. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Employment Law Counselor. If you haven't checked out the previous episodes, make sure to give those a listen and check back in the next few weeks for the newest episode. If you have an idea for a future Plus podcast, you can visit the Plus website and complete the content idea form.